let's take a look at power factor compensation in practice. And so for this situation, imagine some load is driven by a 220 volt source, and this could probably be from the power company or anyone else, and that this load, this load Z, has a real power consumption of 200 kilowatts, meaning that that's just the real power that it consumes, and given the reactive power that it currently has, it has a power factor of 0 0.8. And the question is going to be is, how big of a capacitor do we need to insert into the system to make our power factor more efficient and raise it to 0 0.95? And so the idea is that if we look at the major components here, so if we have our real power, our reactive power, and then our resultant power, or our apparent power, recall that our power factor is that average power over the apparent power. And in our current situation, we have some sort of phase angle due to the current situation. But the hope is that when we take this Q0, this original reactive power, and we add a capacitor, we actually can move this line down. And so the hope is that this new, and let's say it's Q prime, this phase angle is going to be much less. And if the phase angle is much less, that means that the power factor is going to be much better. So we're going to follow sort of a, a three-step process here. And so step number one is going to be, well, what is our existing phase angle? And then what do we need our new phase angle to be? Step number two is going to be, well, now that we know how much phase angle we need to change, what is going to be our new reactive power? So what, how much do we need to change that reactive power to actually lower it? And then step three is going to be, well, once we know this new reactive power, which is based upon the original power and the reactance due to the capacitor, what is the size of that capacitor such that we get the right value? And recall that the reactive power due to an object is the RMS current squared times the reactance, and this will be the reactance due to the capacitor. So step number one is to figure out what our original and our new phase angles are going to be. So on the left here, this is our original setup with the original reactance, and this is going to be our new setup with our new and improved reactance that has the original reactance compensated with the new capacitor. And so recall that the cosine of the phase angle is going to be equal to the power factor. And the power factor that we started with was 0 0.8. And so our current angle, is, so we do the cosine inverse of 0 0.8, is going to be 36.87 degrees. Now in our new system, so we want to find, again, what is going to be the new phase angle for our system. Our new power factor, we want to push it up to 95, so 0 0.95. And so our new phase angle is going to be 18.19 degrees. So what this means is, is we need to add enough capacitance and enough reactance due to that capacitor to drop the line that looks like this and make it look like that. And that will be a drop of about 20 degrees. Step two of our process is to figure out how much reactance we need how much of the reactive power we need due to the capacitor. And we know most of the values here. So if we go backwards, we can find an expression for our original reactive power. And so the tangent of phi of Z1 is going to be that original reactive power over the real power. And again, there's nothing we can do about the real power. I mean, that's the real resistive elements of the circuit. And there's not much we can change but at least now we have an expression for how much the original reactive power was. Now, in the same way, we want to figure out how much the new reactive power is going to be, and we know that because we've already found our desired phase angle. And so our, the tangent of phi of Z2 is going to be this new re reactive power over the real power, which is going to be Q0 plus QC. But we've already calculated this value. This value is fixed, and we just calculated this value over here. So we can rearrange and say that 
QC. Oh, let's make that black. QC is going to be equal to that average power times the tangent of phi of Z2 minus Q0. And let's put in our definition of Q0. And so we'll just copy everything down a little bit. And Q0 was the average power times the tangent of phi of Z1. And so what we end up with is that we can now calculate what QC should be. And for QC, remember that the original real power of this was 200 kilowatts. Phi of Z1 we saw was 36.8 degrees, so 36.8 degrees. Again, we have our 2000 for the original real power, and phi of Z2 was 18.19 degrees. And so the result of this is that we find is that the reactive power due to the capacitor should be negative 84.26 kilovars. So remember, it's reactive power measurement, and so it's in terms of VARs. And now we know how much that capacitor needs to contribute, and now we simply need to size the capacitor such that when we insert it into the circuit, that will be the amount of reactive power due to its contribution. So in our final steps, we need to select a capacitor size such that the reactive power caused by this capacitor will reduce the overall reactive power consumption by the circuit. So this load right here has some sort of reactive power already, but when we add in this capacitor, it will have a negative reactive power because the impedance of a capacitor is a negative value. And so it will reduce the overall power load of this circuit. And to start with this, we need to recall that the reactive power can also be expressed as the RMS voltage squared times the reactance of some load divided by the square of the total impedance of some load. And so this comes from our equation sheet, but generally if we have some sort of load, Z, Z always has a real element and a reactive element and so what we're looking at here is piecing apart both the total impedance of some element and then the reactive pieces of that element. So for the object that we're inserting, our capacitor has an impedance of negative J over WC. And so the reactive elements of this circuit are simply the imaginary components of the impedance. And so that is negative 1 over WC. So plugging in all of our values here, we have our RMS voltage squared times negative 1 over WC for our reactance. So that is the reactance of our capacitor divided by, and then we have the total impedance of our object. So this will be negative J WC and we want the absolute value of that squared. And so, or excuse me, the magnitude of that squared. And so for this particular object, again, if we were to plot this in sort of our complex plane, the total value of this would be negative one over WC. And so what we're gonna end up with is VRMS squared, negative one over WC, and on the bottom, we will just have negative WC, so negative 1 over WC, because that is the absolute value, and that quantity is squared. And so what we have, VRMS squared, negative 1 over WC, divided by 1 over W squared, C squared. And so if we multiply both the top and bottom by W squared and C squared, what we will end up with is that we will have VRMS squared WC. And this is going to be the reactive power caused by our capacitor. And now we can start to fill in different values for this value for the capacitor to get 
how big this capacitor needs to be. So V, the RMS voltage is determined by the source, the reactive power of the capacitor we've already determined. W here is going to be in terms of 2 pi F, and so we'll have to assume some sort of frequency for our source, but if we assume it's a standard US power supply, we will assume 60 hertz. And let's make sure I don't forget the negative sign here, because this is actually a negative reactance. So now let's take a look at the eventual final circuit that we came up with. We need to find out what value we want for C. And we know VRMS because it comes from our voltage source. And the frequency we're going to use, again, frequency, if we turn it back into hertz, is 2 pi radians times frequency. And we're going to assume that this is a 60 hertz source because we're going to be operating in the U.S. So if I rewrite all of my values here, so VRMS squared, 2 pi F times C, and we rearrange all of this in terms of C, we can start to plug in all of our final values now. And so what we saw previously is that QC was negative 84. 0.26 kilovars. Our voltage source is 220 volts RMS and frequency we're going to assume is 60 hertz. And the value that we come up with after all of these long calculations is that we need a capacitor of 4.62 millifarads. And this is actually a, a rather large capacitor. The values that we normally use in circuit lab are down on microfarads or nanofarads. Um, a millifarad capacitor is a sizable amount of charge storage, and so these things would not necessarily be cheap to purchase, but given the situation of how much the power factor uh, charge would be from the energy company, it might be worth the purchase. So this has been a long process about how to just pick a single capacitor, but the equations that we've derived and the process we've gone through in terms of figuring out how much power compensation you need will work for any system because we've assumed a general load and we have added an arbitrary capacitor into the circuit.